everybody. Welcome to our Thanksgiving Eve testimony service, where we have a chance to hear from some of our newer people in our church, and you get to hear some of the stories that I hear. But I just want to say thanks for being here, and uh, you're still going to get a little sermonette in just a minute. But, but we got to thank you from the Israel group, the Isaiah Project, and you guys came through so much uh, on that to support the nation of Israel. So I want to show that right now, just them saying thank you to you. Can I see that clip real quick? David McCrackman here with the Isaiah Projects. Just want to take this moment out to thank you, Grace Church, for sowing into our humanitarian initiatives, especially helping those who are affected on October 7th, such as the Kibbutz Berry survivors. Your donation has helped put together a household item package when they decide to move from their hotel into temporary housing. This includes an oven, a refrigerator, and a washing machine. Because of you, you're impacting the lives today. Blessings from Israel. We raised just under $40,000. And this is, the, but this is the number that impressed me the most. How many in our church did 100? There was well over 100 people that contributed just to that project. So I'm, I'm just saying thank you. And that's a practical way that we were able to bless the nation of Israel and help people that um, just need help. Did you bring your Bibles tonight? Can we do church without the Bible? I don't think so. And so as I kind of introduce it, I want you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. If you uh, didn't bring a Bible, there's one right in front of you there. And uh, that's on page uh, 1445, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And I'm about to preach the whole chapter in four minutes or something like that. Pretty close. We'll see. You guys ready? First Thessalonians, um, okay, don't count my time yet. I just thought of something. I remember 30, 38 years ago when we had just started Grace Church and when we went to First Thessalonians and how much this book blessed me as a brand new church way back in the day. And as I read this first chapter to you, uh, the word of God is true. The word of God is true. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul, Sylvanius, and Timothy, to the church of Amarillo, Texas, of the Thessalonians in God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know, what kind of men we were amongst you for your sake. And you, you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. I mean, they just started a church. And before you know, the church started taking off. And then he's writing back to that church they started. He said, believe it or not, everybody knows about you guys. You followed our example. You became a part of us. And now the word's going out from you everywhere. 
That was hard to feel that when you're just at the YWCO getting started. But I can tell you right now, 38 years later, from you, the word of God goes out everywhere. You guys aren't bored already, are you? <laughs> Notice that they became followers. They became, they became examples to everyone, everywhere. Your faith toward God has gone out. Your faith has gone out, uh, toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you. And how you, Grace Church, Church of the Thessalonians, how you turn to God from idols. You're going to hear testimonies tonight how people turn to God from whatever idol they had, whatever lifestyle, whatever background. You're going to hear that, fresh testimonies in your church tonight. How you turn to God from idols to serve. Not only did they turn, but they to serve the living and true God. You know, some of our friends over here are already serving the Lord. Some have been serving the Lord for a while. But you don't just turn to God, okay, what can I do for God? They serve the Lord, the living and true God. Oh, and then all of us, to wait. To wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivered us from the wrath to come. By the way, if you're not saved tonight, tonight would be a good night to get saved. If you're on YouTube tonight, tonight would be a good night to get saved. If you haven't been saved from the wrath that is to come, the wrath is coming. And we're waiting for our Savior. But while we wait, we've already turned, and we do serve, and we have a testimony. Not overall, like as a church, you all should have a testimony of what Jesus has done in your life. And I know of one answer to prayer that happened today, but I can't go there right now because we don't have time, but amen, amen. He knows how to answer your prayer at the right time. Talk to Mark Key. I can give you that tag. Talk to Mark Key when we're all done. So, okay. Father, thank you for your word. And I do remember this particular chapter 38 years ago. And through all the decades and the stories and the buildings and the congregations and the radio and the YouTube, and you have been faithful to your word. It's nothing that we've done except we've turned from our idols to Jesus. We seek to serve Jesus. And we're still waiting, Lord. We're still waiting for your son. I'd even pray, please come, Lord Jesus, quickly. We do ask for Israel again and the peace of Jerusalem as they negotiate different things at different times, Lord, I just thank you that we still pray for peace. We pray for peace for all the ones involved over there. Yet we know you're holy and you're just and you're true. So we trust you not only with Israel, we trust you with Amarillo and right down to Western and Plains and right down to my life. We trust you. What a privilege to turn and to serve and to wait together with Grace Church. We, we pray for the ones that are going to share a testimony, Lord. And uh, I know how that feels to get up before this group of people and before radio and before you. I know how that feels. Bless them, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Let them say exactly what they're supposed to say to encourage our hearts together. That most of all, the Lord Jesus would receive the honor and glory because he alone is worthy. And all of God's people would say, Amen. <clears throat> so we have six different testimonies tonight. The only problem I have is that they've started to become my friends. And so I can't wait to introduce you to some of my friends. The first one is miraculous. The first one is resurrected from the dead. The first one, his only problem is he's a Kansas City Chief fan, but other than that. <laughs> so he is the newest general manager of Radio by Grace. And I'm here to tell you, I know beyond a shadow of doubt 
that God brought him specifically for such a time as this, not only for Grace Church, but for Radio Grace. If you could welcome Chuck Joslin as he comes up. No, I got, I got That's not a good start. No, we're good. We're good. How is everybody? Boy, I have a story to tell you tonight. Mm-mm-mm. When I was um, 15 years old, I asked my dad what I should do with my life. And he said, well, you got a deep voice. You should probably go into radio. And I thought, well, that's kind of cool. And I lived in a town of about... 3,000 people, <clears throat> and I called the guy, and I'll never forget because he sounded like Kermit the Frog, and I thought, this isn't what I want to do. And uh, being 15, I was a uh, freshman in high school, and he immediately hired me, which blew me away because I was just a kid. And uh, he put me on 6 to midnight, Monday through Thursday, and gave me Friday and Saturday off, and then I worked, I think it was 5 to noon on Sunday. <clears throat> So I had to come up with a name, so being Chuck, I went by the name of Chuck Roast. You know, get it? I seriously, and you know, my, my tag was the leanest DJ in Northeast Kansas, Chuck Roast. <laughs> and I did that, I did that for about a year, and I got good at, at, at doing it, I loved it. And I studied and put everything into radio, and by the time I was 20, I was working in the major markets um, from Indianapolis to Dallas, of course, Kansas City, and uh, Chicago, and so forth. And with that comes a certain ego, if you will, because all of a sudden you're thrown into a culture of drugs, women, and a fast, very fast lifestyle. And I got uh, married to a wonderful human being who I destroyed because of my choices and because of the way I was living. We both were on the same lane, but we wanted different things. She was into money and products that had Gucci, Armani, and I was into drugs and women and getting the ratings and making the money. And I was continuously lying to myself about my life. I was never on the right path. And as I look back now, I can honestly see that God was trying to tug at my heart since day one. And <clears throat> I look and I think to myself, why didn't I listen to him? And I can honestly sit here and tell you right now that the love of money and the love of fame and the love of loving yourself like that will destroy you. And if you don't believe me, Jill, will you put that on the screen for me? I want to take you back to August at 2.02 in the morning. I was coming back from a remote at a club in Chicago. And I was just doing my own thing, and a song came on by Twisted Sister. I was listening to our rock station, and as I bent down to turn up the radio, I looked up, and the next 26 seconds changed my life. I was hit by a drunk who was going 127 miles an hour, and he hit me head on. And as you can see in that picture, those two boards up there at the top those were used by the firefighters to eventually get the engine off my chest. I was in that car on the highway from 2.02 in the morning, and I had to write this down, until 8.36. They had to fly in two surgeons from Cook County Memorial Hospital to cut my femoral arteries because they were worried if they took the engine off my chest, I would bleed out and die. Over the next couple of hours, as I got into the hospital, my family came. They, they told my family that I was not going to survive, that they needed to start making plans and preparing for what was eventually going to be my death. 
Well, 72 hours passed, and I was still alive. I was barely hanging on. I coded nine times, and I was shocked nine times and brought back to life. Then I went into a coma because I had a traumatic brain injury. I was in that coma for 97 days. And it's not like the movies to where you wake up and you're ready to go, and you're like, oh, wow, what happened? It takes days and weeks to wake up. I would try to open my eyes, but I couldn't because they were taped. Or I would try to squeeze my family's hands, and that's when they knew that I was starting to come out of it. Well, eventually when I did, I was paralyzed from the chest down. I could not move at all. I had broken just about every bone in my back and my neck, crushed my ribs, my hips, uh, had 600, over 600 stitches from top to bottom. And my favorite scar is the one on my forearm where the turn signal went in and came out. And when I go talk to kids and stuff and give my story and I show them that, they just can't comprehend that you take a drink and get in a car, that's the result. 18 months later, I walked out. A year into it, I came here to Amarillo to finish my last six months of rehab because at that time, um, my wife was from here. So BSA is one of the best hospitals for cervical and spinal injuries and the rehab that you get from it. And so over that course of time, my life changed and I had new visions of what I wanted to well, do with my life, and I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to start over. And what made me start over was the 23rd Psalm. As weird as that may sound, because when you think of that, you think of death. But there was a very famous pastor in, in uh, Chicago that would come and pray over me when he was in town. And he, I remember very faintly hearing this, and I honestly sat in that bed thinking to myself, I'm dying. I'm not going to wake up for this. They're preparing my soul to go to the kingdom. And then I thought, I'm not going to make it because I'm scum. And as I went through my rehab, it hit me that you cannot have a shadow without light. And he was telling me all along to turn around and find the light. And I did. And when I accepted that, everything in my life changed. I met the love of my life back there. Hi, wave. And we are starting over on a journey that is taking to places I've never been because for the first time in my life, I have peace. And I have something more important than that. I have the love of God that's true in my heart. He gave me a story to tell. I wish he would have done it different. It, it's not fun not being able to raise your neck, but I'm alive. I have a home here at Grace, and I'm building something that will hopefully lead to people coming to accept Jesus Christ. Because at the end of the day, he is all that in a bag of chips. So I encourage you to follow us with Radio by Grace. We have unbelievable things happening. And if you ever want to know more about my story, it's going to be posted on our website soon. But just don't ever give up and just know that God's got your back, Jack. As simple as that. So what Chuck didn't tell you, <clears throat> when we were looking for a general manager, and we hired a professional company to find us one. And so that goes all across the country that Chuck had a very good friend that called him and said, there's a Christian radio station looking for a general manager. And Chuck told his friend, he said, tell me where it's at, I'll move there, I'll move there. Just tell me where it's at. Because the new goal he has in life, he just wants to see at least one person come to know Jesus Christ as their savior because of him. And so his friend said, you don't have to move. You're only six minutes from the church. Six <laughs> minutes. 
So he went to his pastor ahead of time here in Amarillo and said, I'm moving. I have to go to this church. His pastor, First Baptist Church, blessed him, <laughs> blessed him to come here. Father, I thank you for Chuck. I thank you for, I thank you for that accident, the same as my motorcycle upside down. I thank you that things happen in our lives that all of a sudden, it not just gets our attention, it gets our heart, our soul. And you know how to raise the dead in me and in Chuck, in our church. So we, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you for sparing his life. Thank you for energizing him with the Holy Spirit. We continue to pray for his body that it could function, Lord, to bring glory to you. But I thank you for his mind. I thank you for his spirit. I thank you for his heart and the new life he has brought to Radio by Grace. Bless him, bless him, bless him. And thank you for answering Mark Key's prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Thank you, Chuck. Is that okay? Yeah. So, next on the list is my friend Jenny. time. Um, oh, okay. I, I'm Jenny Rankin. Um, I, I started coming to Grace. Uh, the first time I came here was, was April 17th of 22. Uh, it was at the uh, encouragement of, of a very dear friend of mine while we were all out drinking. Um, let's go to church. We go and, and do all of these wild, unhealthy things together. Let's go praise Jesus. Well, at this point, I'm, I'm not very close with Jesus. I know of Jesus. Uh, I know God. I know of the Bible. But I don't really, that's just stuff that's trying to control people. Um, with, with a little bit of, of backstory, uh, growing up, I grew up with divorced parents and with the church. And I say with the church because uh, being able to see the hand that the enemy can have deep rooted in families um, and in long lines of the families and even in the, the churches and the church families. Um, it, it was a misrepresentation of what I know it is now. Uh, I, I, I grow up, my father directs me in the, in the right way, but I wanna go with my mother, and uh, she, she just did not know the best way to lead me, and so I had kind of a, um, an unrealistic view of, of life and, and what life is supposed to be and what I'm supposed to do. And as, as going through that, I, I caused havoc uh, for my dad and my stepmother, uh, dropping out of school and wasting money and getting in trouble uh, until I ended up pregnant. And I know now, uh, my Aubrey was the biggest blessing she brought my family with my dad and, and my stepmother, she brought us together and we were able to develop that relationship through her birth. Uh, but I also realized we're not meant to have children on our own. We're not meant to do it on our own. We're meant to do it by God's will. And when we choose to do it on our own, there are consequences and hard times and difficulties faced by everyone involved. Uh, unfortunately, the child as well. And so going, I'm, I'm raising this child. Now I just need to raise this child and get her to be a productive human. Um, I saw the task, but I got so hyper-focused, I, I lost track a lot of, of the details of what I, I needed to do as a parent and how to better prepare her. Fast forward uh, to 2021, she graduates. She's the best, I mean, I, I don't even know how she came from me because she's so amazing. She graduates, she leaves school. Uh, through this time, I'm, I go through and trying to figure out myself and 
where I belong and who I belong with um, and go through a lot of relationships that we're not going to go anywhere to begin with, knowing that. Uh, and I think that's probably why I chose them. So when my daughter leaves, uh, I, I kind of lost my mind a little bit. I, I don't know Jesus yet. And I, I, I go through unhealthy behaviors. Um, I go through unhealthy relationships. And then all of a sudden, um, I, I, God brings someone to me and this looks like, and what I see now, a relationship in, in the style of, of what Christ wants it to be. Uh, I was able to realize through that what God has planned for me in the end of that relationship because I wasn't ready. Um, and, and through that time, I'm sorry, y'all, I got lost. <laughs> so through that time, though, let me get back. Uh, I come here with my friend Sarah, back to that part. He touched my heart that day, and I was able to get the, the Bible and the Word of God through this man, which was completely directed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, when I left here, I wanted more. I was confused, but I knew I wanted more, and I kept coming. And I didn't really know kind of what that looked like. And so through this time, I'm battling. I'm battling myself. I'm battling the way God wants me to live. I'm battling the way my flesh wants me to live. Uh, and y'all, he had, he broke me down. And he had to break me down and have me sit down somewhere because I was not going to. And through a medical issue, I literally had to sit down and reevaluate things in my relationship with myself and through him and by him totally breaking me down uh that's how he was able to build me back up and that's still i'm in that process now um he he has confirmed uh the, the moment i decided i'm not saved i've never been saved i did not know jesus as my lord and savior and he, he pulled me in. Um, he has shown me the love that I have been able, I have been looking for. Uh, that's one thing I was looking for in my youth. And coming to this and realizing my worth through Jesus, uh, I've been able to model my worth, to prepare myself for what Jesus has planned and God's will for me. Uh, I am in a position where I come across people every single day and I'm learning how to be nicer. And in the longest 10 years that I've been working with people, um, I haven't been nice. I, I was really ugly. Uh, I was mean and I probably broke down a lot of things. And he's been able to show me how, how, how to build people back up. And how to just show love and being able to see the love that he's shown me and I've been able to grow with. Uh, Y'all, it, it, it is so, it, it is the most amazing thing. And uh, He is putting me and has been working to put me right in this exact place to be able to deal with everything that has been in the past to bring it to light because that's where you can move forward is by bringing your stuff to the light. And when you can share yourself with Jesus in all honesty, failures and ugliness and all, uh, he heals it and he can, he can start to change that because he clears it out. And when you're looking for him, you don't have room for the other stuff. And um, I haven't had a lot of room for the other stuff and, and I don't really know how to manage that but he's showing me how to manage that as I'm also continuing to grow with him. Uh, I came to find Jesus over the last year 
And it was a process. I don't think it was a, a one-time thing like everybody else. It, 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 it took a, several months and he kept showing himself to me and proving himself and I'm not even worthy of, of him to do that, but he kept showing me and loving until I had no other option but to turn to him. Amen. And Amen. the power of Jesus is, is, is unmatching and it, it is a journey that is just getting started. And I, I thank you for letting me share a little bit of, of my evening or of, of my story. Father, thank you for Jenny and how, for whatever reason, for your glory, you elected her and predestined her and chose her. And then coming through her life, she could hear the voice of Jesus call her. And all those things, Lord, that you've begun to mend and heal and encourage and use her. I thank you, Lord, for how she's blessed me and our church. Thank you for her willingness to share tonight. Surprise her, Lord. Surprise her on Thanksgiving. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. And can I just do 30 seconds? 30, 30 seconds, 30 Jenny. Seconds. 30 this seconds. This was so important, and I didn't know to start or end, or, and I didn't even mention. Two weeks ago when I came in here, uh, the night before I came to church that Tuesday, I was having a conversation with Jesus about... I want to have a partner, having a pity party for myself. Uh, send me someone, which I need to stop that because he sends me people and I turn the other way. Anyhow, I wanted to be chosen. I just wanted, Lord, just choose me, send, send me and let me somebody that chooses me. The next night, Father God chose me by him coming to ask me to give my testimony. Uh, and I think it was probably a mumbled mess, and I appreciate y'all, but he knew in that moment I needed to be assured, and he gave me that assurance when I was asked to do this. Uh, thank you, guys. You're good. Way to go. Thank you, thank you. So, the next guy had been hanging around our church, and I met him at one of our Wednesday night meals. Got talking with him, and out of the blue he says, do you still have that 480 Elsinore in your garage? And I said, what? He said, that Honda, 480 Elsinore. Now you'd have to know, that was in my garage, the meanest, kickingest, two-stroke dirt bike you can have, I had. And I thought, how in the world, because you gotta go back pre-Grace Church, you gotta go back youth pastor, you gotta go back, and he said, I was in your youth group. <laughs> you were in my youth group? <laughs> now I ain't got the motorcycle, but I still got Kurt, so. Thank you, buddy. There is joy in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. I woke up singing that this morning. So, so I believe that uh, you know God does have a sense of humor because you know uh, He likes to see me sweat, and uh, you know I'm up here, I'm quite nervous, but He also has a soft spot for uh. uh Drunks and stupid people, which is me also. So, back the 40 some odd years ago, I went to a new junior high and got, made some new friends and they invited me to a youth group. I was like, hey, sounds like fun, let's go. And there was this tall, skinny, young, animated, uh, energetic young uh, pastor. And you know, read a scripture and you know, made it to where we'd understand it. And, you know, we did fun. Things. We went to Six Flags and went to Tahlequah, Oklahoma for a little mission trip. And 
whenever he asked me to do this, it reminded me that on that trip, you know, in front of my friends, I'd, you know, I'd forgotten about it, but I gave my life to Jesus. And this reminded me of it. And then, of course, the next day, seeing how God likes to see me sweat, my can of Copenhagen falls out in front of the pasture and the, uh, the, uh, the guy that uh, runs the school we were at. So, yeah, isn't that nice? But anyway, I, after the church, I guess, did whatever the church did, um, everyone went their separate ways, and I went up, you know, chasing things that young, young men chase. And never went to church and never uh, pursued God or Jesus, and, but he never failed me. Was, I gave him lots of opportunities to take me out. But I'm still here giving this testimony. But fast forward to 2005, I decided, you know, I want to learn how to scuba dive. And if y'all have ever been underwater, y'all know God creates some pretty interesting stuff. And you give, and several times I've given praise underwater just for letting me be there. But through that, um, a girl I knew in high school, she goes, hey, I want to learn how to scuba dive. Can you show me? Sure, come on down. I was living in Dallas, and you know, I was single and never been married, never had kids traveling around, scuba diving here and there. And so teaching, uh, you know, making it short, I uh, taught her how to, you know, dive. And, you know, she, we started dating, and, you know, she gave me a second chance, thank God. And then... Shortly thereafter, she says, I do. And sucker. <laughs> but anyway, um, she's been in church, went to church most all her life, and, you know, I haven't. She's gently nudging me to go to church, and, okay, okay, it'll make you happy. And then I started, you know, started going because I wanted to. And then in the lake that we train in, she baptized me, and, and then shortly after that, you know, we're, it's all on the time frame, you know, we came back to Emerald, you know, to, you know, be with our parents, because both of our fathers have passed, and, you know, our mothers need us, right? You know, more like we need them, but we're searching around, and we go to a church, and we're in a small group, and one of the guys in there, he was, Hey, you know, he knows I do a lot of traveling on, for work. And he goes, you ought to check out this radio station. And, you know, it's 99.7 Radio by Grace. And I'm listening to it. And I'm going, that's all right. You know, listen to some scripture while I'm driving. And I hear his voice. And I'm like going, that's familiar. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, I, I know that name. I'm like, man. Hey, babe, we're going to have to go see him. We're going to go check him out because this was my youth pastor way back when. And we uh, had a trip planned to Roatan to do some diving. And, and on the radio station, they talked about a, you know, YouTube. I was like, hey, let's check that out, you know, while we're down there. You know, and I you know, see what he looked if I remind him. And I looked, I said, yep, that's him. But, man, he a little grayer than I remember. <laughs> and then we show up, and he's a little shorter than I remember, too. <laughs> but... My wife brought me back to God, and being in church, I, over the last year or two, I felt drawn to need to be in church. Just go to church and, you know, listen to the Word, and, and here we're getting the Word direct out of the Bible, and it, that's what, it's, it's great, yeah. and I, lacking for uh, the rest of the words. So thank you for letting me be here. And praise God. <laughs> Father, Father, I thank you. I thank, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for your sovereignty. I thank you for Kurt. I thank you for watching over him and 
his life and bringing him back into my life. We just thank you for the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ that knows how to call us and how to keep us and how to use us. Bless my friend, I pray. Bless him, bless him, Lord, for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good job, buddy. Justin. Uh, just so you know, in my phone, I tag different people different ways. So Justin in my phone is Justin Bullrider guy. Not that he rides bulls, but he just reminds me of what a bull rider would be like. So it's actually a compliment. For the, for the record, I've never, I have never ridden a bull, but I used to break Shetland ponies. So I don't know if that takes some away from my card a little bit. But um, I just want to say thank you, guys. Thank you, Grace Church, for letting me be over here and speak about what the Lord is doing in my life. And um, just... It's an honor, and I just say thank you guys, uh, each and every one of you, for, for just bringing me into your own lives and showing me and shepherding me in my walk in this pilgrimage that the Lord has me on. Um, growing up, growing up, it was not easy, um, and I can say that with uh, just a child's heart. Um, if, I, if I can send out anything, it's, it's, it's parents really be there for your children, Communicate with your children because they have questions. And I know that there's a lot of devices out here that are taking you guys' attention. You know us parents, so we got to watch that because growing up in my life, I, uh, I had a lot of questions, but I, I didn't have anybody to answer those questions for me. Um, I remember hearing of Jesus whenever I was like eight years old, and he sounded amazing for what my father would tell me because my father was a Christian. Um, but my mother, she was just, she went to another church, and it's like they spent the entire relationship trying to convert one another. So that was kind of confusing for me. But uh, one thing that I really want to touch on is how I did not grow up in a normal childhood simply because of the trauma that was given to me at a young age. Um, I was taken out of school at first grade uh, because of all the bruising and all the trauma. And... Um, I, had, uh, I was confused on, on is, this what re is this what life is? Is this what parents are supposed to be? Is this what um, trying to basically get some reality for my future and everything, and even wondering if there was a future? Um, my mom was uh, physically abused at a very young age, and so hurt people hurt people. You know, I've, I've come to love my mother, and that's through the leading of the Holy Spirit, through the, through the Bible. Um, I've come to understand that forgiveness is a decision. It's not, a, it's not an emotion. So if there's anybody out there that is basically hurting from, from things from the past, we have hope. And we, we, it, uh, when you find him, when you find the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter anymore. Um, some of that uh, being taken out of school and everything, um, just to kind of point at the neglect that I had. Um, when I was 14 years old, I couldn't even spell my last name. And I don't, uh, I grew, uh, the inner monologue that we, we start to cultivate as a young child, um, you know, and all the things that, that your mother is basically programming you or your father is basically programming you, it sticks to you. It sticks to you like glue. You know, out of the mouth we speak life and death. And you guys are speaking life on your children or you're speaking death on your children. And so I didn't realize that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. And some of these things were following me my entire life. I didn't come to know Jesus Christ until I was 31 years old. And that was whenever I became a man. I was just trying to figure it out the entire time. But that trauma left scars. It, it, it is, it, it's either it's sin no matter what. It's someone else's sin or it's your own sin. But uh, the things that I learned growing up from watching my mother was how to steal, how to lie, how to manipulate, um, how to be a con, art, con artist. And uh, we have eternity written in our heart. We know right from wrong. And, and we, get, we can't shut that voice out. 
Um, I'm teaching my children what, what conviction is, that to follow that, because it is a blessing. Um, me trying to run from all that pain, it led me into drugs and alcohol, uh, being gang affiliated at 14 years old. I lost my entire 20s to methamphetamine because I was just trying to, to run from that voice. And it was the Lord calling me until I finally reached this, this end of myself whenever I was 31 years old. I, I was uh, on the verge of suicide. I had, I had already wrote my suicide letter. And I, was, uh, I know I had, I had four children. I had four daughters that were needing me. I just didn't know how to be a parent to them. I didn't, I never, no one ever taught me. And I would isolate myself from them. I didn't have anything to teach them. I didn't, uh, what was I supposed to say to them? Like, hey, um, just work your way, do your best and figure it out. No, that's, that's not proper. How about this? You let Jesus Christ lead your life and he, he will lead you on to all truth. And it's, it's, it's a joy, it's a peace um, that, that he brings you. And I didn't know that. I was trying to find it in drugs and alcohol and, and all, the, all the things that the world has to offer. And even some of these, this technology and stuff, you're, 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 um, you're just trying to cover something. And, and one thing I wanted you to, to understand Father God, help me, <laughs> is when I came to the end of myself, suicide, I, I, something always told me from my childhood, those seeds that were given to me as my, in my childhood, which was my dad telling me, Jesus, Jesus loves you. I was like, well, how does he love me? I don't even know who he is. I don't know how he is or how he operates. But at the end of myself, I said, Father God, I want to know you. I just don't know how. I don't know where to start, but I'm going to start right here. Um, and it was, uh, I just said, I'm going to give you everything I got, Lord. And if I don't see a difference in my life, then I'm going to end my life, Lord. And that was the best decision I ever made because I took a knee. I took a knee and I said, God, help me. Show me who you are. Show me the length and the depth and the height of, of what you are, what you are. Why do people, why do people talk about you? You know, why, are you just a, a name on a sign? Are you, just, uh, are you just what people talk about but don't be about? You know, life without Jesus is like being in the ocean. And you're scared. And you're alone. And you're just waiting. You're, you're, you're trying to figure it out. You feel like you're going to drown at any moment. And a part of you is like, well, maybe it should drown. Maybe it should take me out because I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I, whenever I met the Lord, I got this holy hunger. I started reading the Bible like my life depended on it. And when I came upon this scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verse 5, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Life without Jesus, you're going to drown. I noticed in the scriptures... Um, Jesus never immediately ran anywhere. He immediately ran to Galilee, Galilee or nothing. The only time I saw him immediately do anything was in Matthew 14, chapter 30, or ver, chapter, thir, sorry, chapter 14, verse 32, whenever Peter started to sink in that water, Jesus immediately reached for him. And he did the same thing for me, coming from my trauma. He immediately reached into that water and saved me, pulled me onto the lifeboat which is Grace Church for me, and, and following me and discipling me, pulled me into the lifeboat. And now I have someone or something to teach my children, which is that the Lord loves us. If he, and and the, the enemy is going to try to lie to you and say he doesn't. If he didn't, why would he die for us? He died for all sin. And he's, he's there for yours for the taking. And I just say thank you. God bless you. Father, I thank you for saving my friend and speaking to him. I'll never forget at that restaurant for lunch and hearing his heart, his soul, and how you had touched him. And watching him, Lord, in obedience, uh, just run after Jesus, run after Jesus. And the blessing he's been to my life and to our church. I pray for him and his family, Lord. They'd have a great Thanksgiving just You've been so gracious and so good. Bless my friend. Bless Justin, I pray. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. <clears throat> Next, we have...
Anthony and Nancy to come up. And uh, what's really cool is I met them at our Thanksgiving, not Thanksgiving, but our monthly get-together meal. And you guys are something else. I don't know which one's going to speak or you're going to support. I'm going to try. Good evening, Grace Church. As he said, uh, my name is Anthony Birnbaum, my wife Nancy. We have been attending Grace now for right at a year. We were looking that up last night and was going through some sermon notes and uh, realized uh, the time flies. We thought it was six, eight months, you know. Um, but what a time we've had. Uh, Nancy and I have been married for 18 blissful years. Y'all caught that blissful part, right? <laughs> no, really, we have shared in many struggles over the years, but we have always tried to keep Christ centered in our marriage. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 4.12, though one may be overpowered, two defend themselves. A cord of three strands is quickly, is not quickly broken. Some of you may know our youngest daughter, Chloe. Unfortunately, she is not with us tonight. She is globetrotting around Central Texas visiting family and friends. Uh, we ask for prayers for her as well because she had an accident this morning and rear-ended somebody. Luckily, everybody was okay. Um, but she's not an only child. Uh, it's the only one that's still at home. Uh, and we wanted to show a picture. Hopefully, they have it there showing our... Uh, family uh, just gives you a little bit of our backstory. We wanted to share this picture as there's six girls between us, Nancy and I. Uh, Nancy has four daughters. I have one daughter, and together we have one daughter. So if you didn't catch that, yes, they're all girls. Uh, we also have ten grandkids. Uh, that we just love and adore. I know all couples will face challenges in their marriages, but for blended families such as ours, there are additional challenges. Conflict with stepchildren, disagreements about new family rules, tense relationships uh, among step-siblings, how to parent, how to draw boundaries, how to break down breakthrough barriers. It is not always easy to know if you are saying or even doing the right thing. Um, I remember shortly after we were married, we were having a family discussion, and one of the girls quickly said, well, let's take a vote. And I said, no. I was outnumbered. I was the outsider. We were not taking a vote. I said, we'll discuss it. Then your mom and I will discuss it, and then we'll tell you the outcome. Uh, the truth is, is I felt like that outsider. There was no way I would take a vote that early in our marriage. Uh, but over time and years, um, getting the girl's trust, uh, I began to feel like I could take that vote. You know, I, I might have a few going my way. Nancy and I became involved uh, with Family Life in 2012, and we have participated in many Weekend to Remember events. Not only has it been helpful in our own marriage, uh, but we've been able to come up alongside of other couples um, and help them in their marriages as well. Uh, we have also had the opportunity to attend several conferences on blended families, uh, which just take a deep dive into marriages when couples remarry and the challenges that they will face. Uh, just a quick uh, background of myself, how I grew up. Grew up in a Missouri Senate Lutheran church and school. And yes, we had religion as a class every day. It was just part of our curriculum. Uh, memory verses, uh, and even though we had that, it wasn't until I was about 17 that I actually 
uh, started having a personal walk with Christ. Although I was baptized as an infant, I later was baptized in believer's baptism uh, with my oldest daughter, and then was blessed to be able to baptize Chloe when she accepted the Lord as her Lord and Savior. So my testimony um, starts at a young age, about five. Um, I grew up in a Christian home, and at the age of five, I had been scared of sirens and ambulances and realized I needed the Lord. And my parents helped me to accept Jesus. At nine, I was baptized by my dad. That's not to go, not to say that I didn't have any struggles. I went through a lot of struggles in my life, young adulthood, um, on into middle 30s. But God was always faithful. And I remember Isaiah 40, 31, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Sorry. They shall walk and not be weary. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. And I just have to keep trusting God and know that he's with me. Um, he's been a faithful God all through these years. And I'm very thankful for Grace, and I'm thankful for Anthony, and I'm looking forward to what God has for us in the future. May I share one quick thing, and I know we're out of time. I figured we got tapped into doing this. I figured I'd be tapped out of time, too. But I just wanted to share, and this was on the uh, radio today. Um, I only listen, really, to Christian music, and it's a blessing I can't sing, okay? And normally I can't name the song or songwriters, but just a short verse that really stuck with me. Um, and I think it's a great message for all of us. And, you know, part of the song goes, on my best day, I'm a child of God. But on my worst day, I'm still a child of God. Thank y'all very much. <clears throat> Father, I just thank you um, for Anthony and Nancy and the road they've been down and what they've learned and how they're willing to uh, not just share that. They want to minister to marriages and families. And I ask your blessings on that. Thank you for their six daughters and all their grandkids and all of the stuff. We just pray for them that they could have an enjoyable Thanksgiving. We're blessed to have them as a part of our church. We thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we have Josh and Gedelia. These guys used to live in Hereford. They don't live in Hereford any longer, and they'll tell you why, I think, right now. Good evening, Grace Church. Hi. Um, so, um, yes, I'm Gudelia. Um, so, growing up, both of my parents believed in two different beliefs about Jesus. Um, I was overwhelmed because my dad would teach one way and my mom would teach another way. And uh, yeah, my dad was Catholic and my mom is Jehovah Witness. So at an early age, I was molested twice by a close family and this completely broke my heart, broke me. Um, I felt angry and helpless and scared and I was threatened about it and I kept silence. Um, I did not go to my parents because I thought that they wouldn't believe me because it was family. You know, family is the closest thing you've got. So, um, it was hard for me to trust anyone close, and this destroyed my character and my self-worth. My self-worth. Um, I carried this for a long time uh, and because it continued. And through a such time in my life, I wanted it to be over. In my teenage years, it led to running away from home, being selfish, and I just wanted to grow up too fast. I was embarrassed and annoyed of how and what I was becoming in relationships, and I never knew how broken I was because it led to heartache and heartbreak. 
So I got together with my husband during my high school years. We were both rebellious and we hurt each other. My husband was into drugs and we started having a family. It was rough because both of us was living in our flesh and our desires and our, it hurt our love and our family. So we didn't know any better. I was led astray and I felt guilty and ashamed and my sins were heavy. Through a difficult time, I came to a friend to help, uh, for help. So she invited me to come to church and to hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verse 3. Uh, verse 3 through 4, I understood that Jesus died for our sins so that we could be forgiven and live in relationship with God and now and for eternity. And as of November 7th of 2021, I had responded and accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Amen. Romans chapter 10, verse 9, I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit and... Uh, it was after a service of church um, in Hereford. Uh, we, went, we did go to Genesis. Uh, we went home. I remember I was in my room, closed the door. Uh, and he said, in your testimony, write this down. I knew in my heart I never wanted to sin anymore. I was speechless with trembling, and I realized I was a sinner. You know, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for by grace you have been saved. And God is faithful when we fall apart and he speaks through his word. So Jesus used my sin to help turn my husband's life around to lead our family. Jesus saved our marriage and he can save yours too. So, uh, yeah. Here's my husband. Good evening, Grace Church. My name is Joshua, and I grew up not believing in God. You might have seen me up here with the worship team praising God. Last year, you wouldn't catch me dead in a church, let alone on stage worshiping. I didn't like church. I hated it. Growing up, we didn't have God in our home. My parents divorced at an early age. It was devastating. I didn't know at the time, but Jesus was with me. Matthew chapter 19, 13, and 14 told me this, and I summarized it as Jesus telling me, when you were a child, I was with you. All children are in my care. Years passed, I was happy again. Life was carefree. Life seemed wonderful. As I looked to the future, it didn't take long and my views changed. I realized I had to perform to be accepted. Trouble came during my adolescent years in the form of drugs, gangs, and violence. Life seemed like a circus. Ephesians chapter two, four, five. But God, who is rich in mercy, even when we died in our sin, he saved us. My belief started to shift after the death of my young cousin. One night we were drinking at my apartment, having a good time. Of course, we all had too much to drink. I offered my cousin to stay the night. And he was going to, but he left with two of his friends. The last thing he told me was, I'm coming back. He died about an hour later, crashed. The other two friends survived. I felt guilt and shame for a long time and wondered why and how there's got to be more than this life. Matthew 5, 4, Jesus told me, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. God was telling me that lonesome feeling you had, that was me talking to you. I knew things weren't right, but I was afraid to change. I was afraid of what my friends would think, so I ignored God and drifted farther away from him. Instead of running to my Lord, I ran to the world and what it offered me and my addiction. Life became a performance, go to college, get the right degree, make lots of money, buy a big house, a nice car, me, me, me. But what about my family? What about my marriage and my kids? The only God they know is through me and through my experience. I was trying to find my own way to figure it out and it was frustrating. I'm trying to listen to God. I got my own flesh, my own desires pulling me here. My family, my friends, all these things are distracting me from the truth. And it was difficult to give in, especially when you're young. John chapter 10, 27, 28, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. They follow me, and I give them eternal life. They will never perish, nor shall any man pluck them from my hand. It was very difficult. I thank God for his faithfulness, his mercy, 
his endless grace. For my wife, her endless prayers, without her and God, I would not be here today. I should, I should have been the one to bring God to my family. But the Lord used her to reach me, to shine her light unto me, to bring me to RBG and to church. The Lord saved my marriage. He delivered me from myself. May 17th of this year, I truly repented and surrendered to God and asked him to take over. I shut down my pride and cried out uncontrollably, forgive me, Lord, I submit to you, help me. I can't do this on my own any longer, I need you. If it is your will, you can save my marriage, God. Nevertheless, if it is yours, not mine. Romans 10, 13, whoever so, whoever so shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Since that day, I could honestly say I have never been so happy, so at peace and filled with joy in my heart. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Even when I was in the fire, you were there. When I was alone, you were there. You never forsake me, Lord. It was I that forsake you. You put me through the fire and helped me come out like gold. Now, I truly understand your meaning for fellowship, love, and the church. Once I went through the storm and trials, it, it is for me to inspire somebody else, for me to pull the weak ones up, for you to pull the weak ones up. We don't go through this because of our own selfish reasons. We go through this to give them a testimony of how far God has brought me. It was never about me. I thought about me, why am I going through this, God? He told me, slow down, back up. Who are you going to inspire? Who are you going to tell about the glory and the grace of God if you don't go through it? Thank you, God. Thank you, church. I thank God for this. You are all a blessing to me and my family, a true blessing. I don't have nothing to hide. My burdens are heavy, but when I'm weak, he's strong through me. He speaks through me. So I leave you with this. Humility. Be humble. Acknowledge him in all your ways. If you don't understand your purpose, ask God. But ask him in sincerity. What's my purpose, God? Why am I here? What am I meant to do? Just remember, he hears. He hears you. Sometimes he can't tell us all at once. It may be too much. Thank you. You know, when they lived in Hereford, we have a full power in Don, Texas, right next to Hereford. So ready by grace would blast them there. And I just had to be reminded, they moved to Amarillo for Grace Church. And they sit right there. And now he's playing up here. And, and you what? I'm helping in Treehouse. Oh, and she's helping the tree. She loves it. Oh. Father, I just thank you for a great night together. And as we wrap up this service, that you blessed us, Lord, with new friends, some that literally move here to be a part of our church, others that you've taken away to still represent you, Lord, in different parts of our country. But I thank you. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus, Lord. I pray that he's the center of all of our testimony. And we confess we still need a savior. We still need your grace. We still need you, Lord. So for all the ones that spoke tonight, for Grace Church, for me, thank you, Lord Jesus, for being our savior. I pray that we could celebrate tomorrow with family and friends. Look forward, Lord, to Sunday. And then we're in the Christmas season. And before we know it, a new year. But we're waiting, Lord. We're waiting for your soon return. If not, I pray that we would represent the gospel, that we would preach it, Lord, with power, and that you would continue to bless Grace Church, and that our testimony, Lord, would go around the world. For the glory of Jesus and all God's people would say, amen.